Our next speaker is, you, we've already met him, um, it's Ethan Mellig from the park, but I'll give you a little bit of his background. He's a self-described birding nerd. He grew up in the Point Pelee area, which kind of explains where he comes by that. I think most of us know that he's an absolutely uh, uh, tremendous nature photographer. Um, I told him this morning, or asked him this morning if he was doing his nature calendar, and he says, no, it's just too much between the superintendent job and the uh, the uh, kids at home and stuff, so he's not doing it this year, but he did say that he wants to get back to that at some point, so I certainly look forward to that. So please welcome Ethan Malig. Thanks very much, everybody. I get the uh, spot right after the break when you've had a chance for some of those wonderful snacks, and hopefully you're all... Uh, energized off those unbelievable butter tarts, by the way, whoever made those. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I only had one. If possible, um, we could put my uh, presentation up there, it would be great. Um, I just want to start out in full disclosure, I am not an expert on climate change. I'm a generalist, that's what it takes when you're a manager at a park. But uh, we have incredible teams of people you know, at, the, at Parks Canada who, uh, who are working on climate change and like Scott Parker's in the room here today, I just asked Scott and Brake if I could put him on the hot seat if there's a question I can't answer, but uh, anyway. Uh, I am going to share with you a little bit about climate change planning that's happening in, um, in our Parks Canada field unit that these two parks are a part of. And I better start off by showing you that. Um, there's a first, so we'll go, uh, I guess I've got control of my next slide here, I hope. There we go. So the, we, have, we have a very large district that we're a part of here. Of course, we have Bruce Peninsula and Fathom 5 uh, parks right here in Tobermory, Fathom 5 National Marine Park and Bruce Peninsula National Park. And our, our field unit or district goes all the way across up to Ottawa and takes a big swath, a big wide area of, of central Ontario. We have the two parks here. We have Georgian Bay Islands National Park, which is over on Eastern Georgian Bay. And over in the uh, Gananoque area, we have Thousand Islands National Park, which you can see it here, as uh, somewhere in here. So there's there's four national parks, or three national parks, and one national marine conservation area, and a whole bunch of national historic sites as well. And uh, we do work very cooperatively together across across our region on uh, on on all sorts of things, and certainly climate change is one of those. It was a great presentation that Eric did before, and it's a good setup for this one. Uh, I want to start with um, by showing you that you know Parks Canada has a path to net zero emissions. That's uh, Eric talked a lot about you know the efforts to move to net zero emissions, and our plan is as well to reach it by 2050. And it's 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 a uh, it's definitely a it's a journey, and there are, there are areas where we're able to advance more quickly, and areas where we're waiting for technology to cap, catch up, and. We've taken a regional approach in Parks Canada, trying to hit you know, the worst offenders, I guess, where, where we're seeing you know, the greatest emissions, tackle them first, and then work our way forward. So it's prioritized in that way. And there are some challenges along the way with technology. There's certain areas where the technology, for, for example, moving to electrification of certain types of vehicles is, is not quite there yet for our needs. So we're trying to tackle the things that we can do now, where the technology is there and the opportunities are there now. And uh, in, the, in the long term, though, net zero by 2050. I won't get into too much about that. What I want to do is give you very specific examples of things taking place in the local parks here and at the other sites in our field unit that, uh, that illustrate this. So the first one I want to talk about is, is our effort to reduce carbon footprint. Sorry, it didn't uh, forward here. There we go. Yeah, so the first is, I want to talk about reducing our carbon footprint by electrification or alternative energies. And this is where we're, we're putting a tremendous amount of effort and investment right now. And it's, there's a number of things that we're doing. Of course, we're shifting our fleet you know, to, uh, to EVs and battery-powered equipment everywhere we can. And some examples of that, you can see here the, the, um, the truck that you see up here is a, is a Ford Lightning. We just got it a few weeks ago. 
It's only one of 13 in the, uh, in the federal government, and uh, supply chain issues have been really challenging for us uh, to, to, to get electric vehicles, maybe just through COVID and supply chain disruptions and things. So we are, you know, as aggressively as we can, replacing our fleet with electric vehicles. The neat thing about that truck, if you see it around town, is there's no engine in the front. So you actually have, a, in addition to the bed in the back, you get the uh, storage space in the front where there would have been an engine in the past. It's, uh, it's a great truck, and I have not had a chance to drive it yet. The team is really excited about it, and uh, they don't let me take it for spins. We also have, uh, you know, we're replacing our, you know, like our utility vehicles we use around the campgrounds and in backcountry areas and going to electric. So this is a, an electric Polaris we're using for cleaning rounds. We're looking at ways of having smaller vehicles wherever possible, you know, elect electric. And, uh, and in the meantime, we've, we rent a lot of vehicles in the summertime. We, we've been getting uh, hybrid electrics uh, as they've been available. So our fleet going in that direction is really important. As well, we're trying to replace all of our HVAC systems to shift away from heating with fossil fuels, you know, oil furnaces or, or propane furnaces, to electric systems and heat pumps. And we're, you know, we're tackling the buildings that are, are, are worst for emissions and, and least efficient. And uh, that's, that's in our immediate plans. We're, we're literally working on some of them right now. For instance, here in Tobamori, the Marine Operations Base, we're, we're just evaluating the putting heat pumps in right now, which is great. Um, the other thing is uh, public EV chargers. That's something we want to do in the park, throughout the park, to be a real leader in that. Uh, we are a little bit limited right now in the electrical grid supply that comes into the national park. So the whole Cypress Lake area, for instance, we've, you know, we've added certain amenities there in recent years, you know, a new campground hub and things. And, and uh, right now, the, the lines that supply that area, and that's an area where we would be looking at you know, total electrification of all of our, all of our services and, and chargers for the public. The lines going in there probably can't handle that, the demand right now, so we're looking at actually doing a study right now to what would it take to upgrade that hydro corridor so that it can meet our needs um, in the park and for the public coming to the park. One of the other things we've been doing, and hopefully if you've had a chance to visit around the park, is seeing the, uh, the places where we've gone off grid, and uh, that's, uh, that's a good thing for reducing emissions. Uh, it's also a very practical thing in remote locations. So for instance, at, uh, like at the park parking lot for Halfway Log Dump is a solar array that runs that entire facility. Uh, they had a trails you know, where people go to hike out to, to the grotto is, uh, is off-grid with a solar, solar array. And the gatehouse at Halfway Log Dump as well is a full solar with batteries. You can see an example here in the picture of that, and that one right there. So we're trying to do that. It makes a lot of sense, and, uh, and we'll be looking at more options for that. And as part of the study about the, the hydro corridor coming into the Cypress Lake area, we will also be looking at if, if more solar options are, are the way to go. Like for instance, could we have solar, solar stations set up for electric vehicle chargers? That might be more practical in some cases. So we're working on it. Other vessels are gonna take some time. The, we wanna move to, you know, we use boats to get around these parks, uh, you, know, the, you know, the Marine Park and then the other two parks which are in our district are island parks. And boat technology for electric motors is not quite there yet um, for the types of uses that we have. And we're hoping that that's why in the phased in plan for us to get to, to zero emissions, we'll be moving to those um, as those technologies improve in the coming years. And we're confident that they are improving. Okay, next slide. The other thing is um, building climate change resilient infrastructure, and with you know with the the changes in uh, in weather and 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 uh, the severity of severity of storms, the uh, the 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 water level changes that we've seen, you know, really high levels a few years ago. You can see in the picture here that this is a dock from from Thousand Islands uh, National Park that was completely underwater because it was an old crib design. The water levels came up, the dock was not able to, to move up accordingly, and uh, it's underwater. So in any new infrastructure, we're looking at making it climate change proof. So the new docks are floating docks, and uh, you know, with, uh, with an adjustable ramp so that if the water goes up or down, the infrastructure can still handle that change. That's really important. There's lots of, lots of, uh, lots of ways we're doing that. Um, in our buildings, we're looking at things like we're, you know, with, with rain events, where more extreme rain events, we're looking at increased eaves and downspouts. Um, yeah, being able to withstand higher winds. Um, 
and, uh, and uh, you know, new high water offsets as well too. The bottom photo you see is an aerial of Sing Sands. And a number of years ago, we redid the infrastructure at Sing Sands, including the, the boardwalk there. And that boardwalk was put on helical pilings, which that's, that's, what our, that's what our asset manager calls them. I call them big screws that go in the ground. And that's a very environmentally friendly way of doing, um, doing a build there because it can be done without big machinery, so it's not damaging a very sensitive location. It's uh, also, um, it raises the boardwalk up and there's room underneath it for natural process to occur. You know, wind and you know, movement of species, sand movement, you know, natural, natural processes to build the dunes there. Um, but the other benefit, of course, is that if water levels come up, then, um, then, then it's still, it's fine. It's, it's, uh, the water can come up and it doesn't damage the infrastructure. It's built, it's climate change proof. And we saw this summer, for anybody who lives along the lake or on shore, it was a really high seiche, you know, like, which, you know, like when the water comes up quite, quite suddenly. And, uh, you know, the water did come into that area. It was one of the higher ones we've seen in, in some time and did not cause any damage to that boardwalk because of the way it's designed. to the next slide here. The other thing you'll, anyone who's visited the park has known how busy it's become in, you know, over the last 10 years. There was a very significant increase in visitation. And, and uh, sorry, I got like one ahead of myself here. And we've taken a lot of strategies to try and better manage that visitation. We've done that through reservation systems for parking. We have to pre-book in advance and getting that message out and, uh, and uh, you know, time limits so we can rotate people. Um, those systems have been really good. And, and one of the, there's, there's many, many objectives of why we've done that. It's to offer a better experience for visitors so that they're not sitting in lineups. And uh, also to, to stop, you know, prevent some of the traffic, dangerous traffic congestion that we've seen. However, there's another benefit in that when, if people aren't coming up here without a reservation, that's, that's fewer people driving, you know, fewer emissions, fewer people idling in their cars. And I'm really pleased to say that this summer, it you know, really feels like, like a bit of a watershed change for us. We were down about 25% in the number of vehicles that we turn away from the park. And that's you know, been many years in the coming. It's the first time that visitation levels have felt sustainable in the park in, in a long time. And uh, that's good. Less pressure on the park, less pressure on the surrounding communities, and, um, and better experiences for the folks that are here. Better experiences for our staff, less angry people kind of showing up and can't get in. That's great. We are looking at opportunities for green transit in the future. So that, you know, the concept of having, a, um, having you know, people, visitors arriving and parking in one spot, being able to walk around town perhaps, and then jump on, a, on an electric shuttle that would take them to locations as opposed to everybody driving individually. There would be definitely a reduction in, in uh, emissions in doing that. And as well, other benefits, um, safer, better experience, less road mortality taking place by all those individual cars on roads. So that's something that we are looking at, and we'd be looking at you know, possible partnerships with the municipality to examine that. Okay, Eric, Eric's presentation talked a lot about the importance of forests, and that's, uh, that's something that uh, is a really important part of, uh, of a park. We are, we are very focused on land securement and connectivity. And uh, you know, we know that protecting intact forests and ecosystems you know, supports carbon sinks and carbon sequestering, and that larger, you know, connected wild areas are better for ecological resistance. The better we can keep the ecological health of the parks, the better, the better they'll, you know, all the species and ecosystems will be, the more resilient they'll be to climate change. So some of the things that we've done is, um, in recent years, of course, is continuing with the acquisition program to create, to finish Bruce Peninsula National Park. It's young as national parks go, it was 1987, when when we first were established. And uh, we have been buying lands on a willing seller, willing buyer basis to complete the park. The, the actual study area, the size the park could be when it's complete, would be 156 square kilometers. And since 1987, we've, we've purchased 140 plots of land towards, towards completing the park. And the, big, you know, the, biggest, the biggest news story was in 2018 when we were able to purchase the Driftwood Cove property, which alone accounted for about 10% of the size of the park and there are 13 square kilometers in size. And that's the picture you see there. And that's, uh, that's a Driftwood Cove shoreline up here. And overall, 
Um, it's also really, it's worth, I think it's worth mentioning, I, you know, you, you hear a lot, especially if you read social media, people saying that, well, the area's been ruined by over-visitation and things like that. And I think certainly the experience has changed because there was a time when you could just go and get in anywhere when you wanted. And that's not the case anymore. Visitation is managed a lot more uh, holistically and carefully now. But when you look at the park, the actual developed you know, footprint in the, in the park is very small, less than 1% of the area of the park, and 99% of it is left in a, I hate to use the term wild, that's a very subjective term, but uh, it, is, it is largely, um, largely not visited. Other parks in our district as well are doing lots of important things. Thousand Islands National Park, you know, over in, in the Gananoque area is a really good example. It is very critically located on the Algonquin to Adirondack access, access, which is really important for movement of species, migratory species, and there's a lot of development that's taking place, you know, in that area, just that's just a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a busy area. So strategic acquisition of lands to make, keep that connected is a really important priority that we are doing with other partners in that area. One of the best things we can do for climate change, of course, is saving good, large, intact natural ecosystems, and that is a primary focus for, for our parks. Sorry, trying to move here to the next one. This remote is a little bit finicky. There we go. Building ecological resilience. I have to credit Scott Parker, because the first time I ever heard the term ecological resilience was Scott, years and years ago, very ahead of his time. But everything we can do to keep the ecology of the park, the ecological integrity whole and intact is important and it, it future-proofs us against climate change impacts. There's so many things that we could list as examples here because this is the everyday business for our teams, but I want to touch on a few things. Um, preventing invasive species is one of the key priorities and uh, we obviously want to stop them from coming in in the first place and if they are here and establishing, we want to manage them the best we can. And you can see in the pictures here, this is brand new this summer. This is, a, uh, this is our, actually our mechanic, Evan, and he, uh, he designed a system where we have a, a, a power washer that can be put out um, on site for kayakers to wash their kayaks with hot water prior to, so they don't go into the interior lakes, which, which in the National Park are free of in, um, zebra mussels, for instance, and quagga mussels. So that's, uh, that's a really important thing to stop, the, uh, stop those species from getting into those lakes. Um, you can see the other picture here, the team out uh, pulling spotted knapweed and other invasives from the Singh Sands area, trying to, get, uh, trying to keep those from further establishing themselves. At Georgian by Islands National Park over in the Midland area, they've got a big program called the Impede the Reed program. You can see that picture here where they're removing uh, Phragmites from, from, from the park shorelines. And I know that's activity that, that has taken place on the Soggy and Bruce Peninsula too, and the Biosphere Association playing a really great lead role in that. Um, I don't have pictures to show all these other things, there's just so many things, but continual work on species at risk. For instance, um, you know, we're working with the Gosling Research Institute of Plant Preservation to make sure that we're, we're, we are, we are prop, you know, have prop saving seeds and propagating endangered species plants. Um, the On the Road Again project, I know there's people in this room who are volunteers with the turtle trackers, and those are, that is specifically designed to, to prevent road mortality impacts. So you'd see the eco passages that go under the roads connecting critical wetland habitats and uh, so, that, so that critters pass under the road and don't get run over, as well as turtle trackers going out, finding nests along roadsides and putting the protective boxes over them so that predators like raccoons and, and skunks don't get in and eat the eggs to give them a chance. And it's great to see. I know many volunteers in this room who participate in that. Um, restoration, we are, you know, as we acquire new lands in the park, we're restoring those over time, you know, back to to create contiguous forest, and because uh, uh, we know how important how important that is for uh, for long-term ecological integrity and connectivity, and Eric mentioned the two billion tree initiative. Certainly, we're taking advantage of that in our field unit and uh, in our parks, and uh, and planting a lot of those trees as well. It really dovetails nicely with properties we need to restore. So, it's great. I don't know how many of the billion we're going to manage to do ourselves, but we're going to try as many as we can. So, and lastly, and it's great to see the exhibit over here that. Uh, from that the Sources of Knowledge for, um, group is taking a real lead on the CBINS project. You can see the CBIN in operation in the bottom, bottom right of the screen. And uh, just another way to help to keep plastics out of the, uh, out of the aquatic ecosystems is really important. And uh, really appreciate the Source of Knowledge, the leadership on that program. And another one that we've started is a partnership with Clear Your Gear, and that's about getting um, nylon and plastic fishing lines out of the water so that they're not uh, 
not contributing to the microplastics and, and other impacts taking place in, um, uh, in aquatic ecosystems. Okay, next slide here, if we can get it to go. There we go. Um, monitoring the ecological health of the parks has been a long, I mean, that's, that's a really important part of what we do at Parks Canada. And it's, all, it's important because we're able to understand change that's occurring in the parks and, uh, you know, we're hopefully understand where that's coming from, what are the environmental stressors, whether it's climate change or other, other things. So we have lots of monitoring programs and they feed into, um, you know, the regional work with partners to better understand large scale impacts like climate change. So but we could have a long list of all the different uh, projects we do, but some highlights are we do a lot of bear monitoring work with, uh, with uh, the Soggy Nijibwe Nation and Mystery Natural Resources and Forests. We're doing fish assessments with, uh, with Soggy Nijibwe Nations, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forests and U.S. agencies. Um, we do colonial water bird surveys every year um, on, uh, on islands in Fathom 5 that uh, feed into the environment and climate change uh, Canada and Canadian Wildlife Service programs to monitor those. And one of the exciting things from this summer is um, we, we finally got our, our uh, it has the nickname of the smart buoy, uh, but the research, research buoy, you can see that, that yellow uh, buoy there um, in the bottom right. That is a, a very high tech uh, buoy that is placed out in Fathom 5 and is continually collecting a whole range of data that will give us an incredible you know, long term data set um, about about factors um, that are you know things that are things that are happening in Fathom Five, and over time we'll be able to see trends. Hopefully from that, I mean the benefit of having something like that is it's out there all the time, and it's doing its job continually, taking taking readings continually, and that's something that the labor to be able to do that would be really tricky if uh, with people. So it's great that automated tool. Really excited about that, and more to come. Our plan is to be able to live stream that data into our visitor center, so that people can come and see real time that. But the real value is what it collects over time and what that tells us, especially about climate change. Um, just want to end on that. Uh, there's uh, a lot of great work that, uh, that is taking place and so much more to be done. And uh, really thanks to all the partners, many of whom are in this room, who do this work with us. And, uh, and if you have uh, questions, I'd be happy to take a couple questions. If it's outside of my area of uh, expertise, which wouldn't take long to get to, I would, uh, I can certainly connect you with the experts that are on our teams, so. Thanks. Yes, we'll, we'll take the question. There's a microphone here. We'd like you to speak into the mic, so it's coming. Oh, you've been working too hard. So, um, study area. Do you remember the study area? I want the latest percentage. What percentage of the study area has Parks Canada purchased? An easy one for me, Jan. Um, so out of the 156 square kilometers, we're at about 90% right now. So we're getting close. I thought, yeah, yeah, it's the parks, you know, the parks guy handles that. So thank you very much, sir. We don't have a forester per se, but we do have, we have a team who, you know, of ecologists who, who work on that issue and we have a visitor safety specialist who works with them to help identify that. That is an area where, where we, I think we need to invest more to understand more of the potential changes and risks. But um, it, is, it is something that we are working on, but uh, probably more room to grow there. is sticking around for lunch, so please uh, take your questions, questions to him. Um, thanks very much, Ethan. You know, I was very impressed that you have an F-150 electric. That's, wow. 
I didn't know there was any in Bruce County. I should have brought it today. That you should have. You should have brought it today. That would be uh, that'd be terrific. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, next year we can have maybe Milt McKeever present to us about all the, the the action items that the municipality is engaged in with respect to climate change. So thanks very much. That's uh, greatly appreciated.